together this day in this beautiful setting, let us do so in a prayerful spirit. We pause and reflect this day, O oh God, as we arrive at this milestone on a long journey from yesterday to the most distant tomorrows. We call this commencement, but it all began so long ago with baby cries and infant smiles, with school's first day, with wisdom's first glimmer, with parent dreams and child efforts and A's and B's and C's and 1's and 2's and 3's. We call it commencement, but it all began long ago. And from the first, your goodness has led us and fed us and sustained us. You have filled our worlds with families which care and friends who love and teachers who inspire. You have awakened our minds by filling the world with mysteries to solve and lessons to learn and gifts to share. Gracious God, we call this commencement, but really it began long ago. And it is this very truth that you have been with us from the very beginning, which allows us to gather together today and to step forward to tomorrow with confidence and safety and trust. O oh God, we see the signs of your presence in the brightness of this day and in the brightness of those who gather here. Recognizing your presence, allow us to truly rejoice. Amen. Please be seated. There are some remaining seats uh, behind the faculty uh, for those of you who wish to take them. I would like to take a moment to thank uh, Reggie Hall, the class of middle school 1990, for piping us in today, and he will also pipe us out. It's great to have Reggie back. Mr. Cates, Reverend Christensen, Mr. Sullivan, trustees and overseers, faculty and family and friends, and the class of 1993. One of the few important pleasures of a headmaster is the presentation of a graduating class. The class of 1993 offers special opportunities and special memories. I spoke in the fall at Convocation about the quality which I believe uh, most makes us human, our potential to write, create our own history. Each class at Berwick, now numbering 202 on this day, has written its history. Each class creates a legacy. Each class enriches the heritage that is Berwick and will continue to be Berwick. Clear as all of that is, it is still difficult on occasion to identify the heritage or the history of a particular class. Not so this year, not so this June morning, and not so for the class of 1993. Sarah stole my line last night. I will remember today's senior class as family. I will remember today's senior class as a community of sharers. It was a, it's was a rare ethic of quiet generosity. I was struck last night by the course's rendition of Somos El Barco. What an appropriate anthem for the class of 1993. We are the boat, we are the sea. The stream, I sail in you, you sail in me. The stream sings it to the river, the river sings it to the sea, the sea sings it to the boat that carries you and me. The boat we are sailing in was built by many hands. The sea we are sailing on touches every sand. I started understanding this family quality, this sharing quality, last spring in the middle of the uh, student body election. The five candidates selected by that ballot came into me and petitioned that no one be the student body president. I was dumbfounded. They went on to say they did not need a student body president and that uh, they did not want a student body president. The office could be shared by all five. The boat we are sailing in was built by many hands indeed. A little later, the class's uh, proposal on senior projects was not at all what we expected. 
The faculty and I had anticipated individual efforts, apprenticeships, internships. The class wanted to all join together in a single project. We had anticipated apprenticeships or studying career areas. The class wanted to design a project to improve the academy. That same sharing spirit was evident three days ago on the senior run on the field behind us. 25 runners, 515 laps, more than two times the challenge. I still haven't had the courage to telephone the trustees who made that original challenge. I might suddenly find myself graduating with you. The strangely wonderful thing about sharing, about family, is that it enriches everyone. Giving, as we learned very early in our lives, giving is getting and getting is giving. The frustratingly difficult thing about sharing is how hard it is to sustain. Even the best hardest, hearted of us seem to pick our times and places. The class of 1993 showed unusual consistency. In fact, as outstanding as its individual accomplishments are, I am more struck by the constancy of the class. Perhaps those lifers, Hava, Lori, Ryan, and Jeremy, provided the class with some mystic staying quality. In any case, day by day, to borrow the title of another of the year's choral selections, day by day, the class of 1993 was family, sharing its time and talents with one another and with all of us on the hilltop, day by day. The class brought its intellectual talents, its considerable intellectual talents, to the hilltop. Bill Dogan was a national merit finalist, and Josh, Brad, Alec, and Chad were national merit commended scholars. Beth, Emily, and Joanne were inducted into the Spanish Honor Society. Brad, Bill Dogan, Chad, Alec, Mindy, Danielle, Sarah, Karen, Matt Bromley, and Adam Roberts were inducted into the French Honor Society. Three of that number, Bill, Alec, and Chad, three of that number, scored first, third, and sixth in the state of Maine in the level five French exam. Our cum laude scholar, scholars are Brad, Bill Dogan, Hava, Joanne, Chad, Adam Roberts, Alec, and Joe. And what an honor roll that is. What an amazing list of accomplishments and talents. But what was more important to me personally was the intellectual respect the whole class showed one another. My, uh, one of my favorite moments was a morning assembly when Chad uh, got up in front of us all with no announcement or warning to share an idea. And the class shared it with him. I would quote Chad. The scientist does not study nature because it is useful. He studies it because he delights in it. And he delights in it because it is beautiful. If nature were not beautiful, it would not be worth knowing. It would, and if nature were not worth knowing, life would not be worth living. We are all the scientists. Indeed, we are the boat, we are the sea, we are the scientists, day by day. The class of 1993 also built an astonishing athletic record and shared those trials and those triumphs with us. Think of our MVPs, Beth in soccer and basketball, Matt Genest in hockey, Steve in cross country, Dave and Sarah in lacrosse, Jesse in baseball, I think an entire soccer team. Or consider our three sport four-year Bulldogs, Sarah, Lucas, Jesse, Jeremy, and Matt Genest. How many times did they don the blue and white to represent Berwick? How much better were we? How much better are we for their constancy? Day by day. The class created a set of memories which will long remain a part of the lore of Berwick's athletics. Sarah, an A's All-Star, in goal, in goal, all the way to the national competitions as a starting goalie for New England. Brad and Steve, Eastern League All-Stars, long-legged and long-striding, leading the cross-country team. And I might add, a couple of days ago, completely humbling a headmaster in the senior run. Lori and her famous three-set tennis matches and her knack for winning them. Jeremy and his love of the battle, love of the chase, and the 100-plus points he scored in his lacrosse career. Matt's long home run, 
right where all of you stand, matching the mark set a number of years ago by his brother, a mark not matched by any player between the two brothers. Jesse behind the plate, winning the honor of the Eastern Lakes Kobe MVP and the Nepsack Tournament MVP. Day by day, great memories. Teams left the hilltop to represent Berwick in tournaments. Beth, Lori, and Danielle for the A's Get Tennis Tournament. Dave, Jeremy, Evan, Chris, Lucas, Gary, and Joel to the Nepsack Lacrosse Tournament. Was it my imagination or was that Ryan's best game ever? The men's soccer team. Josh, Gary, Jesse, Evan, Alec, Joel, Matt Ginest, Jeremy, David, Dag, Chris, and Adam Mitchell. Taking Berwick to the finals in the New England tournament. What a proud moment that was on the fields of Amherst. The baseball team, led by Matt and Jesse, repeating, repeating as New England champions after starting the season with three losses and after putting Mr. Libby in a near state of cardiac arrest. Day by day. The class of 1993 also shared its considerable artistic talents. Melissa returned from Australia to enrich the dance program. We were never sure when Matt Bromley would appear with his saxophone, but we always welcomed the moment. And what about a strip canoe that was made a few weeks ago? Xerxes with Adam, Joel, and Alec simply got better and better and better day by day. And in the spirit of their class, those three young men kept appearing to share their talents in other settings, in other productions, with other audiences from the middle school play to the senior art show. Also, in the same spirit of family, more than half of the class joined in the production of Little Abner. What memories they provided. Hava, Lori, Beth, and Danielle singing, put them back. Matt and Adam flexing as the much improved husbands. Chris as Earthquake Magoon, Dave as Evil Eye Flegel. Adam Roberts showing his range by moving from the evil Mordred last year in Camelot to Mary and Sam. Bill as little Abner, parented by Joel as Pappy, and Emily as Mammy. Matt and Lucas as the sinus, and Evan as the mayor. Day by day. The class of 1993 extended its sharing past its own number. The academy itself is a better place for those efforts. The Hilltop Cornerstone with co-editors Chad and Jess and a supporting cast, became a more regular and higher quality part of our campus life. Student government, led by Hava and Beth, took on a number of issues. Perhaps the most fundamental of those was the senior project idea. Think of how our campus has benefited from the class of 1993's own senior projects. Justin's campus signs, Sarah and Danielle's mural, Aaron and Gary's bleachers, Mindy and Rob's rescue of the Hayes House grounds, Gabby, Lori, and Beth's gym mural, Jeremy and Josh's biology mural, Matt and Chad's mineral display, Matt and Dave's amazing fence, <coughs> Emily's work for the new library, and Hava and Karen's signpost gardens. Day by day, we became a better place. The class is sharing extended past the upper school. Think of the Big Sister and Big Brother program and all the lives you touch. Ned spent time several years ago at a Sioux reservation in the Dakotas, and Jessica spent time a couple of weeks ago at a Shoshone reservation in Wyoming. Jessica, Hava, Danielle, Lori, and Sarah worked with the elderly. Jesse attended the National Teen Summit. Terry, Preston, and Evan cleaned up a beach. Bill Harding, Bill Dogan, Brad, and Joanne did volunteer medical work. Melissa Mead worked in a daycare center. Her supervisor simply asked if Berwick had any more like her. Sharon volunteered at a wildlife center. Jonah and Melissa McLaughlin helped at veterinary hospitals, day by day. Is this not as it should be? A talented group of individuals which day by day put the interest of friends and family first and which reached out from the hilltop to our greater community. The class of 1993 was a perfect prescription for many of us, a headmaster included, whom age and the times have discouraged. Day by day, it showed that progress is possible. 
day by day it showed we still have history to write. Somos El Barco concludes, So with our hopes we raise the sails to face the winds once more, and with our heart we chart the course never sailed before. The class of 1993 will surely face the winds, but it is a vessel made of sturdy stuff. It is a community of sharers. It is constant. It is family. Day by day by day, it will chart that course never sailed before. Thank you. There was going to be an ad lib presentation at this point on the Mean Teacher Award, and the award did not arrive. But for the record, Mr. Hawks has garnered that honor one, yet one more year. <laughs> Alex Silverblatt started his Berwick career in 1984 as a fourth grader. That does not exactly qualify him as a lifer, uh, but he got awfully close. His academic accomplishments include his induction into both the French Honor Society and the Cum Laude Society. He was a commended scholar in the National Merit Competition. Alec has graced the Academy with his musical talents as a member of the band Xerxes, as a member of the Jazz Ensemble, and on any number of other occasions when he volunteered to support theatrical presentations and other events. He played varsity soccer and was a member of that fabled team in the fall. September will find Alec attending Oberlin College. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the salutatorian for the class of 1993, Alec Silverblatt.
another part of Mr. Ridgway's letter. Right. Another part of Mr. Ridgway's letter read that my generation does not see that improvement or, or progress, collective or personal, is probable. I believe that personal progress is definitely possible. I can make it possible. I can do it myself. But collective progress is impossible until all, all the members of that collection have made progress themselves. Everyone must build their house and build it well, step by step before the neighborhood can be created. Right now we have very little to start with. You have a hole in the ground, you have some concrete, some ready mix concrete lying around, and a lift of two by fours. If we can garner materials, we have the potential. We can build a house, but we must take our time to build it, build it, build it well, make sure it stands up, and then when our house is built, we may look to our neighbors and aid them. Then when our houses are built, we may look to more people to come join us. And then the neighborhood is created, and then the town. And in this way, collective progress can be attained. But to repeat, I do believe that we must concentrate on our own houses first, build up our houses, make sure they stand, and then our houses will form the neighborhood. Thank you. Mr. Sullivan received his A.B. degree from the State University of New York, did graduate studies at the University of Cincinnati, and completed his master's in education at the University of New Hampshire. He joined Berwick's faculty in 1974. He has served the academy in a number of capacities, from Latin instructor to history instructor, and from head of the history department to the dean of students. Mr. Sullivan's passion for history, even if it is old history, is matched by a great deal of courage which he tests on a daily basis in town government as the chair of the water district. Mr. Sullivan may have done his most memorable and honorable service as a class advisor for the class of 1993. It is my pleasure to present our commencement speaker, Mr. James Sullivan. President Cates, Headmaster Ridgway, Reverend Christensen, trustees, overseers, alumni, faculty, parents, friends, and most importantly, members of the class of 1993. Several weeks ago, when I asked Beth for the umpteenth time what arrangements that she and Hava were making for a commencement speaker, she looked me in the eye and asked if I would speak at your graduation. Now that request caught me completely by surprise and somewhat speechless. Those of you who know me understand that I am rarely at a loss for words and my response to her was, are you sure that you and the class want me to speak? She assured me that I most definitely was the class's choice and I agreed to speak this morning. As I walked away heading to class, many thoughts began to rush through my mind. I was thrilled, deeply honored, that you wanted to make me an integral part of your graduation. Visions of many previous graduations and senior classes, the three classes I advised who precede you here, other commencement addresses and speakers, and finally the work I've been very privileged to do with you in the last four years all came flooding back. In many ways, we end our journey as we began it, with me as the speaker, except that today you are the centerpiece, the reason we gather together as we celebrate your accomplishments. We gather not for me to begin you as young and somewhat nervous freshmen on your journey, but to honor you, to bring a fitting and well-earned closure 
to one chapter of your life here as members of this community. As those thoughts filtered through my mind that day, two other thoughts also occurred to me. I had finally endured long enough here at the Academy to join a platform party and a deep sense of sadness that this would be nearly the last opportunity that I would have to be with you here collectively and individually. I've watched some of you for the last 10 or 11 years, lifers, and many others who joined you along the way at various stages, grow and mature into the supremely outstanding men and women that you are. And that alone creates and sustains in me a very special attachment for you. As many of you know, I have very mixed feelings about graduations, having participated in some 18 of them. On the one hand, I rejoice in your achievements, individually, collectively, your enthusiasm, your willingness to accept the responsibilities of leadership of the student body, your pioneering of senior projects, which is a legacy which will long outlive you. On the other hand, I feel a very deep sense of sadness at your leaving. I shall look in vain for familiar faces in September, and I do not know when I shall see them again. The winds of fortune, chance, opportunity will scatter you in a myriad of directions while we who remain here continue to work with other classes. It has always been a paradox for me that while I grew older, greater in girth, lighter on top, my students have always remained the same, continually challenging me and enlivening each day. I have discovered, with their help, that I am far less certain about what I know and far more certain that I know less than I think I do. I become more convinced as time passes that you have taught me far more than I could ever have taught you. I have been amazed continually by you. I rejoice in your challenging, your willingness to do that, your challenging of what is accepted, your use of that simple interrogative, why? Returning alumni, and I certainly hope very deeply that in the years to come, you will, you will return. They often look at me and they ask, are you ever going to look any different? You look the same as you did 10 years ago. My response is that education either burns you out quickly or keeps you young forever. Indeed, you have helped to keep me young forever, to keep my mind lively, and I thank you for that. As that day wore on, it dawned on me with a growing sense of unease that I would have to choose a topic around which to build a speech. I thought, what am I possibly going to say to these graduates? What profound truth, what culminating advice have I to offer you at this stage? Do I tell you that this day marks a rite of passage for you to adulthood, that you go forward prepared to face life's challenges, that your hard work over the years, your parents' investment have finally paid off, that you're ready? for college? No, you already know these things, and some of you s demonstrated that far more eloquently than I could last night. Additionally, you haven't been children requiring some profound message or lecture from me for a long time. Now, you know me best <clears throat> as a classicist, a historian, who is most comfortable in the mists of antiquity, amid the lucid prose of a Greek or Latin author, such as Thucydides or Xenophon, Cicero or Tacitus. And quite often, when I need to clear my mind so I can concentrate on some task, I turn to Cicero. And so it was when I needed a topic for this morning. Cicero once wrote, history is the witness of the times, the torch of truth, the life of memory the teacher of life, the messenger of antiquity, 
the transmitter of the values and the lessons of civilization. In that short sentence, Cicero summed up the function and the message of history, and within a broader context, the function of all education. History illuminates the past, it makes the present comprehensible and the future visible. As such, if we are willing to examine it, history provides us a benchmark of our conduct and our progress as human beings, enabling us to avoid the mistakes of the past, to emulate our successes. This morning, I would like to touch upon some events in the past in the hope that they will cause you to consider deeply some very disturbing current trends. There is abroad in this country today an ill wind blowing with ever increasing fury through nearly every segment of society, a wind which touches us all and one we cannot ignore. That wind is an old and pernicious evil masquerading under a new name and concept. Forty years ago, the term employed was McCarthyism when throughout this land, in schools and universities, as a condition of employment, individuals were compelled to sign loyalty oaths. In Hollywood and throughout the artistic media, in all walks of life, people were careful what they said, with whom they associated, lest they find themselves ostracized, repudiated by their friends, or blacklisted and fired from their employment with little hope of again gaining work in that field. Promising careers and lives were ruined, and many never recovered. McCarthyism belongs to the mists of history, but it is reborn as PC, politically correct thought and speech. It has had many guises and different names in the past, but it has always had the same intent, to limit, to stifle, to silence, to destroy the ideas, the thoughts, the speech, or the creative energies of human beings because someone or some group found them objectionable. Yet men and women bridle at such limitations and have in every age fought against them. In 63 BC, a man of humble origin who had risen to the pinnacle of success as a legal advocate and was considered the foremost orator of his era, became consul of Rome at a time when political strife threatened to destroy the republic he so loved. Because he was not of the nobility, he lacked the support of powerful political allies, and many in his position would have tread carefully, would have spoken words of compromise, becoming aware of a conspiracy hatched by a dissolute, embittered patrician to overthrow the government, Cicero, with little support from his colleagues, who chose to give Catiline the benefit of doubt in the absence of absolute and concrete proof, gave a series of orations designed to expose that conspiracy to awaken his countrymen to the danger. These orations were delivered in the face of silent hostility from men who did not consider Cicero their equal politically or socially. In the course of these orations, Cicero exposed Catiline's conspiracy, won the respect and the gratitude of his colleagues, his fellow citizens, and was hailed as the father of his country, the savior of the republic. For a further 20 years, employing the power of his mind and his words, Cicero refused to be silent. He would not be silenced by a powerful political coalition who sought to impose dictatorship even though the more politic course, the safer course of action, that which would have led to further political benefits in office, would have been to go along quietly, to compromise, accept the inevitable. He did not equivocate, he did not dissimulate, he did not prevaricate, and he was heard. In 43, after again attempting to rouse and warn his country of the dangers of another would-be tyrant, Antonius, Cicero was assassinated, his head and hands cut off to be nailed to the great rostra in Rome, the scene of so many of his speeches and triumphs 
as an object warning to those who would dare to speak in opposition against policies they did not believe in. Who today remembers Antony, except as a character mouthing Shakespeare's words in the famous funeral oration for Caesar? But Cicero still speaks to us two millennia later. His words still embolden us to stand firm for what we know to be right, regardless of the cost. But if you are afraid of unpopularity, surely that which arises from severity and sternness is not to be feared more than that which arises from inertia and laxness. If, however, it were to seriously threaten me, I have always been of the opinion that unpopularity gained from doing what is right is not unpopularity but honor. In more recent times, the heirs of Cicero have spoken with equal passion in regard to the obligation we have to protect freedom of expression and thought. Perhaps no greater modern master of English prose, whether spoken or written, has existed than Winston Churchill. As a young man in school, no one would have prophesied that he would rise to a unique greatness. His masters considered him slow, a dullard, who would amount to very little because he could not master Greek or Latin. Fortunately for us, he mastered the English language and history, and to the despair of later listeners, French, whose pronunciation he continually fractured. He was considered politically unreliable because he switched parties more than once and committed the gravest of all political sins. Rather than merely hewing to the party's position, he took his stance on what he considered to be principle, grounded in the interests of his country. For nearly 10 years, he was pilloried as a warmonger, a man who could not be trusted, regularly howled down from the galleries and members' benches of the House of Commons as he crucified the government for its blind policy of appeasement in the face of a rising nemesis of evil, slowly but surely extending a reign of tyranny across the face of Europe. Few listened and fewer believed as he sought to awaken Englishmen to the looming danger. But in her supreme hour of crisis, when England stood alone as the last surviving redoubt of freedom, she turned to the one man who alone had refused to prevaricate, to equivocate, or to dissimulate, and who was heard. For 18 long and lonely months, Churchill's words rang forth to inspire those who loved freedom to gird themselves for the long struggle to defeat a monstrous tyranny which threatened to extinguish freedom before the United States entered the war with its guarantee of ultimate victory. Who today remembers Stanley Baldwin or Neville Chamberlain except as weak-willed men, the architects of appeasement, a policy grounded in weak compromise and lack of principle? Who today can forget the debt all free men and women owe to Churchill? Churchill had many famous utterances, and there are many I could cite, but none quite seems as appropriate as this. Never give in, never give in, never, 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 in nothing, great or small, large or petty, never give in except to convictions of honor and good sense. In the mid-1950s, at the height of the Cold War and McCarthyism, a brilliant theoretical physicist, a scientist more responsible than any other for the construction of the atomic bomb and the birth of the nuclear age, Robert Oppenheimer became the foremost scientific victim of the fears of that time. Oppenheimer, unknown to many who only think of him as a physicist, was also a deeply observant philosopher, very troubled with what he and other scientists had brought into being. Unlike his colleague Teller, who considered it his life's mission 
to construct the hydrogen bomb, Oppenheimer opposed its construction on the grounds that as a weapon of mass destruction, it had used not as a military weapon, but as a weapon against civilians, one which would lead to an enhanced arms race and possibly the extinction of the human race. When his political masters could not compel his silence or influence his beliefs, they destroyed his reputation by impugning his loyalty based upon his opposition to the development of thermonuclear weapons and old friendships, canceling his security classification, causing his removal from the Atomic Energy Commission. Oppenheimer, abandoned by his colleagues who were fearful of being tarred by the brush of association, never again worked in the field of nuclear physics and spent the remainder of his life studying and writing at the Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton. His views, however, did not change, nor was he willing to remain silent about the fears of that era. The open society, the unrestricted access to knowledge, the unplanned and uninhibited association of men for its furtherance, these are what may make a vast, complex, ever-growing, ever-changing, ever more specialized and expert technological world nevertheless a world of human community. During the same period of time, an era when it seemed the rule of reason discourse, political and intellectual, was giving way to fear and a demand for unreasonable consistency of thought, political belief and conduct, when individuals were judged not on the quality of their thought or speech, but on their associations and their supposed loyalty to this country, one man stood forth to oppose a rising tide of blind zealotry. Twice his party's candidate for president, an intellectual deeply steeped in political history, convinced of the innate goodness of mankind and the rule of reasoned men in a democratic society, perhaps the last candidate who was not the captive of handlers, spin doctors, and 30-second sound bites, a man who wrote his own political speeches, Adley Stevenson, waged a long, lonely, and at the time politically futile campaign for the soul of democracy, freedom of thought and speech. Stevenson was tarred by his political opponents as an intellectual, an egghead, an appeaser, soft on communism, the leader of a party which had lost China, and one who could not be trusted to lead the free world. The labels, and this was preeminently an era of labeling, stuck long after S Stevenson ceased to be a viable political candidate. Stevenson's public career was blighted to his death by these labels, even the Kennedy administration hesitated to make use of his manifest talents, since Kennedy himself considered Stevenson to be soft and prone to appeasement. Stevenson could easily have trimmed his words and thoughts to improve his political standing. Such was not the character of the man or the public servant. Principle, honor, and character are not so easily compromised. He didn't prevaricate, dissimulate, or equivocate either. And his viewpoint is perhaps best summed up in these words. Unreason and anti-intellectualism abominate thought. But shouting is not a substitute for thinking. Reason is not the subversion, but the salvation of freedom. I began this morning by suggesting there was an ill wind blowing in this nation today. Nowhere is that fury blowing harder than in schools and universities, where once again, unreason, anti-intellectualism, and shouting are replacing reason, discourse, dialogue, and thinking. Individuals are again being condemned and silenced because they argue, they enunciate controversial thought. The ill wind, the shouting down of unpopular views, 
the mindless censorship of human creativity, the demand that thought and action be politically correct, is the antithesis of what any educational institution must stand for. It must be anathema to those who love liberty and freedom. You may ask, how much longer is he going to go on, and what has this got to do with me? It has a very great deal to do with you today. One year ago, Elliot Pazan, one of the two men who mentored me here as a young instructor and who became responsible for shaping my career, movingly and eloquently described what for him was the essence and the spirit of this academy, describing this academy as a state of mind, a spirit. I can't state it any better. I certainly can't state it as eloquently as those of you who did last night in music and in speech during the baccalaureate service. Spirit here is more than the acquisition of facts in a vacuum. It is more than mere intellectual preparation for life. That spirit also encompasses a willingness to listen to the opinions and the thoughts of others with an open mind, to disagree with those opinions judiciously and on their merits, to argue positions and thoughts on the basis of reason rather than passion, to base your opinions and conclusions on reasoned and rational discourse. It is these principles which I and my colleagues have tried to inculcate, to instill in you. Above all else, we have sought to develop in you a spirit of innate respect for divergent opinion in the belief that though a thought, an opinion, a point of view, a work of art, a piece of music may be one we do not agree with nor personally like, but it has a right to be heard, to be produced, a right to rise or fall on its merits alone. I believe we have succeeded. In the years to come, you will be tested. You will find yourselves in situations where a howling majority or minority will attempt to silence you or someone else who articulates a viewpoint which is considered incorrect. It is my hope that you will not be silenced, you will not prevaricate, you will not dissimulate, you will not equivocate. Rather, you will rise to defend your own or another's point of view, their right and yours to think aloud, to be heard. For if you do not, if you remain silent, if you, remain, if you allow another to be silenced because of an unpopular viewpoint, if you bend and twist and dissemble, if you compromise conscience, principle, and belief, then upon what issue can you or will you stand each of us must decide for ourselves those issues of conscience and principles upon which we make our stands. The Greek historian Polybius, who well chronicled the hubris of Roman political leadership in his era, wrote, There is no witness so dreadful, no accuser so terrible, as the conscience that dwells in the heart of every man. You go forth from this academy to join the ranks of 200 years of alumni who have preceded you as part of a legacy from this institution to the nation she is nearly as old as. There are those who confuse tradition and principle with sheer and mindless consistency of thought. Those who presently argue from a position of political correctness have forgotten some sage words of advice from Emerson. A foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds, adored by little statesmen and philosophers and divines. With consistency, a great soul has simply nothing to do. Speak what you think today in hard words, and tomorrow speak what tomorrow thinks in hard words again though it contradict everything you said today. These are times which demand hard words and consistency of spirit. The liberty of thought and speech, the ability to exercise that freedom 
is no mere philosophical construct to be left to the realm of little minds in esoteric debate. In every age, liberty has been sought, defended, and died for as the concrete fulfillment of the soaring spirit of the human mind and human creativity. Perhaps here, in this nation which was founded on that very principle of liberty, we too often take for granted and we give too little thought, not only to the ancient meaning, but also to the nurturing and defense of that liberty encompassed in the First Amendment. Liberty assumed as a given, liberty unexercised, liberty unprotected and not zealously defended, is liberty endangered and liberty ultimately lost. You, collectively and individually, have demonstrated in so many ways, in so many arenas, that you have absorbed, you do possess the true spirit of this academy. I have no doubt that you are among the finest men and women we have to offer the world beyond this hilltop. I salute you. I honor you. Go forth from this place and this time secure in the knowledge that there is nothing you cannot achieve, nothing you cannot encompass, possessing minds and a spirit bus buttressed by principle, conscience, and honor, minds not closed but open to the challenges which await you. Thank you. President Cates, on behalf of the faculty of Berwick Academy, I am proud to present the class of 1993. All members of the class have successfully completed Berwick's academic requirements. Bradford, Bradford Thomas Adams. Emily M. Battis. Sharon P. Bemis. Matthew W. Bromley. Christopher Michael Brooks. Karen Lynn Brown. Justin E. M. Call. Don Paison, would you please join us? Jessica Chalpin.
Jonah L. Fernald. Jesse C. Freeze. Edmund Locke Frost. Jeremy S. Gagner. Joanne Gates. Matthew M. Janest. Terry V. Halcom. Philip, Philip, this is really William. We've called him William all year, but Philip Robinson Harding. <laughs> Ryan T. Harmon. <laughs> Mrs. Kahlberg. Ava Rebecca Kahlberg. <laughs> Stephen G. Cron. Chadwick Allen Legit. Evan Lewis. Horace Preston Liversidge. Mary Melissa McLaughlin. <laughs> Melissa Kelly Mee. <laughs> Gary J. Melville. Adam D. Mitchell. Danielle Hathaway Peters. Melinda S. Philbrook. Adam W. Roberts. Gabrielle J. 
Jessica Rahulik. Kevin Joshua Scott. Lucas Jason Sevigny. Elizabeth Ann Shirley. Mrs. Silverblatt. Charles Alexander Silverblatt. David G. Wood. The class of 1993. The Cogswell Gold Medal is awarded to the Academy's valedictorian. Chad Leggett entered Berwick in 1986. His academic career is the stuff of legend, including memberships in the French Honor Society, the Cum Laude Society, and the Commended Scholar Recognition in the National Merit Competition. He was the first student representative on the Academic Committee, and he served as co-editor of the Hilltop Cornerstone. Chad has played varsity tennis for three years and was co-captain of that team this year. The fall will find Chad moving west, far west, to attend Stanford University. It is my honor to present the Cogswell Gold Medal winner and the valedictorian of the class of 1993, Chad Legend.
As our ancestors refined their perception of time, they developed a calendar. And although we use this calendar to plan our future, the future remains unwritten until it becomes the present and we write it. We will never foresee every twist in our lives. But then, what would life be without the challenge of dealing with the unexpected? In his work, The Advancement of Learning, first published in 1605, Sir Francis Bacon presented what he considered to be the greatest pursuit in life, the quest for understanding. He wrote, and I abridge, Solomon the king excelled in treasure, building, and in service. Yet he made no claim to any of these glories but only to the pursuit of truth. For so he say expressly, and I quote, the glory of God is to conceal a thing, but the glory of the king is to find it out. As if, according to the innocent play of children, the divine majesty took delight to hide his works, to the end to have them found out. And as if kings could not obtain a greater honor, than to be God's playfellows in that game. We became God's playfellows the moment we asked our first question. Our realizations from the hours we have spent pondering our existence are pursuing an interest, playing music, climbing a mountain, reading a novel, watching the clouds drift by, listening to the course of birds building with the coming dawn, following a falling star, are all part of our discovery of the universe, all part of this greatest game. Our studies at Baroque Academy have heightened our ability to observe and question what surrounds us. And it is our ability to observe and to question that enables us to better comprehend the world, ourselves, and each other. In the words of Bill Cosby, the greatest part of life is meeting someone you would like to meet again. Our relationships with other people are not only as important in our lives as the search for understanding, but complement the search as well. In the relationships we have built up here at Baruch Academy with students or faculty, we have experienced not only discovery, but companionship. Our pleasure comes from sharing discovery with someone else. Here at Berwick, we have met and worked with someone we would like to see again. We are fortunate to have been part of a community built of individuals who offered other perspectives on confusing concepts and who are willing to debate ideas. How often do you find people who are willing to explore Drumlin? to canoe the Salmon Falls River, to oversee an independent study, to keep original proofs discovered by students, to offer personally designed trips to France, to count the number of times the word green appears in Las Casas' version of Columbus's log, to build computer programs to demonstrate the principles presented in class, or to add a personal touch by bringing cupcakes in on someone's birthday. It is this companionship and learning present here at Berwick Academy that makes knowledge worth obtaining. Our experience here has given us the qualities of observation, questioning, and thought, qualities we will take with us to write our future. We leave here with a foundation to deal with the twists we will encounter in our lives. We are fortunate to have the next four years in which to enhance our ability to question and observe, to expand our knowledge, and to meet more people with whom to share our discoveries, so that we may pursue what inspires us. To our classmates and to our teachers, we are indebted, and to them, we offer our applause.
after the recessional, the class of 1993 will form a receiving line back on the field. Uh, we encourage you to use that opportunity to meet and, and congratulate all the members of the class. After that, we have a uh, reception and buffet over in the Commons, uh, and we uh, greet you all there uh, to uh, go on with the uh, day's celebration. Uh, for now, uh, thanks uh, to Reggie, and will you all please stay seated while Reverend Christensen offers the benediction, and play, please stay seated during the recessional so that we can all share in it. Ladies and gentlemen of the class of 1993, I'm sure I speak for administration, for faculty, for parents, for friends, for all who have gathered here. When we say we embrace you with our love, we embrace you with our best wishes, we rejoice in your accomplishments, and we offer you our most heartfelt congratulations. We offer also to you our prayer that the God who has guided you and brought you to today will continue to reveal that divine self to you in the rest of this day and indeed in the rest of your lives that that God who has blessed you with minds that are open to learning and understanding will open your minds also even further to new discoveries, discoveries of truth of honor and justice and mercy for all God's children. May the God who has brought you here lead you forth in peace.